actually, I had started my road into the uh, music business uh, through uh, pu public relations and publicity. I was not doing management. And uh, I had a call, a phone call, from a very nice lady asking if I would please come to uh, hear a performance of La Boheme uh, uh, that was being given in a public middle school here in Manhattan. And uh, she wanted me to hear her orchestra. And this was the Opera Orchestra of New York, and the lady was Eve Queller. And she was very engaging on the phone. And uh, I showed up at the performance, and it was a truncated performance of La Boheme, which was uh, semi-staged. Uh, there was no chorus, so act two was a bit reduced. But the performance worked, and I'm, I was very, very affected by what I heard. And from that point, I, uh, I decided to be uh, involved uh, with Eve Queller. And um, we've known each other all that time. And I would have to say that we know each other about 45 years, which I guess is a good part of a lifetime. Well, I think initially it was the music. And uh, I have a great passion for the voice. And when you come to a performance and the paramount part of what you're hearing is your enjoyment and appreciation of the voice, I thought that that was a very interesting thing for me to be involved with. And since this was at the, we had no idea what opera orchestra was going to be. Uh, Eve had conceived the organization um, about two years earlier, primarily to set up an orchestra to train musicians in operatic repertoire. We had no problem in New York of uh, wonderful musicians. The problem we had was that most of the musicians were trained in the symphonic orchestral literature and not in opera. And with opera, there are various things that you need to develop uh, which are a bit different from uh, when you're uh, playing in a symphony orchestra. And a lot of it has to do with not only the uh, integration of listening, one instrumentalist listening to another in the orchestra, but also melding that with listening to what's going on on stage. If you play in an opera orchestra, you can't ignore the fact that there are singers and a chorus on stage. Uh, there's activity and action going on. Uh, and you have to be responsive to that. And I think that one of, her, uh, one of her prime motivations was not just to teach the repertoire, but to teach those skills, which um, are not at the highest point when you're, when you're doing symphonic work. There were a, a one or two other performances in public schools. Uh, and then, um, uh, UNI had a very, very small board at that time. I believe it was five, five members. And uh, so it was decided that they actually wanted to move the concerts out of the public schools. Um, and at that time, they moved for a season into uh, Alice Tully Hall at Lincoln Center. And uh, so the initial two seasons of opera orchestra what we call the pre-Carnegie Hall seasons, were done at Alice Tully Hall. And that's where Eve mixed repertoire. She did some standard repertoire pieces, uh, such as the Tales of Hoffman, but she also mixed it with uh, Respighi's Belfagor and um, Giordano's Fedora. Uh, and it was really the beginning of what opera orchestra eventually became. Um, Eve had spent a number of years as a very successful coach and assistant conductor. In fact, uh, it was Maestro Judas Rudel who brought her into the New York City Opera. And uh, she was an assistant conductor there for a number of seasons. And um, uh, Eve wanted to branch out her own uh, feelings, her own talents, and try to uh, uh, become, uh, try to get more satisfaction out of what she was doing as a musician. She loved working and loved coaching, loved working with the voices, young, working particularly with young singers. Um, but she was also curious about operatic repertoire. And uh, she, she studied a great deal. She studied conducting. Uh, she was a graduate of, of New York City Music and Art. 
and uh, she had an extensive background in music. This was uh, something that goes back in Eve's life to, to her childhood. Eve had this uh, innate curiosity about, about repertoire, about opera. She's, you know, I remember her, she and I talking many times. She said, there's this wonderful aria from such and such opera. What is the rest of the piece like? And it was a, really a matter of discovery. And uh, she spent a great deal of time researching, uh, going to Europe, going into the libraries, particularly, for example, at the Paris Opera and in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Verdi Conservatory in Milan, and looking at the autographs of certain pieces, and trying to find out what the roots of some of these operas were, and whether these pieces were viable, or whether just the, the, just the arias themselves were viable. And um, she, she did a lot of research, and she came to the conclusion that a lot of these operas were very, very worthwhile to hear again. They hadn't been heard in many, many years for various reasons. Certain composers fall out of favor, and yet one or, one or two of their arias remain popular. So it was, it was actually this curiosity that started the Opera Orchestra of New York. And the first season in Carnegie Hall, she did um, Rossini's William Tell and Meyerbeer's La Friquem. And we did both of them in their Italian transcriptions because at the time, that's the way these operas were done. I mean, if you did them at all. I think Rossini's William Tell, I know from my own experience, I had heard it one or two times in Europe, uh, particularly in Italy, and um, uh, it was a real, what I call, Italian gut buster opera. It was a very exciting piece done in quite a truncated version uh, in most of these places. And it was famous because the tenor arias were so difficult and, um, and of course, it's the story of William Tell. And of course, we all know the overture, which was when we grew up, when I grew up anyway, was associated with the Lone Ranger. So uh, there was some, something about William Tell, and there was a motivation for doing it. Um, the second opera that Eve did was Meyer Beer's La Fricana, and it was done because we had actually uh, Richard Tucker, the great American tenor, uh, as our featured artist, and uh, the opera was really built around him, and of course the famous aria O Paradiso. Well, we discovered that the opera itself was quite worthy to, to be heard. And it was a continuation on this, of discovering the pieces that were done by many major composers and many composers who have kind of fallen off the radar. And uh, many, many times Eve would come up with a piece uh, we would do it, and all of a sudden we would find that it was being revived in other places, not just in concert, but the curiosity of individuals had been sparked to the point where they actually wanted to, to stage it. Um, a number of the pieces that she did, one in particular which was a um, uh, performance of Zandonai's Francesca da Rimini that uh, hadn't been done at the Met since the 1920s, it hadn't been done in the United States for about 50 years. And um, the, the pr performance that uh, Opera Orchestra produced with Placido Domingo, Matteo Manoguera, and Raina Kabaibanska was a huge success. And the people discovered this, this kind of opera, which was, it's not a Verismo opera. It's kind of a post-Verismo Italian piece. It comes from a, a school of writing which is very, very demanding on the voices and orchestrally so rich that any conductor would just love conducting it. And of course, we know that years later, the Met revived it in a very beautiful production uh, with Renato Scotto and Placido Domingo and Cornell McNeil, and it was a very huge success. So that was just one of the things that happened. I know that Eve's had a great impact on the revival of Czech opera, uh, particularly uh, Rusalka. Uh, opera Orchestra produced uh, a performance of Rusalka uh, a number of years ago, uh, I would say more than 20 years ago, certainly before Rusalka became almost a standard repertoire piece. And people hearing this opera for the first time in its original language, um, I think they discovered something that uh, was, was quite marvelous and kind of not only relaunched Rusalka, but also gave a, an impetus into not only Dvorak's music, but other Czech composers. We know Smetana's operas by The Bartered Bride, but 
uh, Eve was responsible for doing a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, Smetana piece uh, called Dalibor, which uh, was a, the performance that was done at Carnegie Hall, which was a feature for the great tenor Nikolai Geta, was historic in the reaction that we had from the audience. And people began discovering not only what this opera was and who the, who the, the, uh, the composer was and a little bit more than this kind of like folksy Czech opera was something much broader, almost on the level of, let's say, Beethoven's Fidelio because the story is very similar. Um, there are a number of Russian pieces that were done before the Gergiev image began to click in in New York. So there were a lot of things that, uh, that, uh, that Eve, from her own ingenuity and her own knowledge, brought to the surface. And I think that not only opera in America, but opera internationally owes a great deal to her for, her, for what she did and what, what opera orchestra did over a 40-year period. It was very strange. I was in Italy back in June, and... Um, I was listening to the, there's a program on the Italian radio on the Rai tr uh, 3, uh, which is devoted only to opera. I mean, in Italy you can have a, a program like this because there are enough people interested in opera that you can have a radio program not only once a week but every day that highlights what's going on in the opera world. And uh, that day there was a, um, a commentary uh, from the, uh, the, the interviewer he was talking with another opera personality in Italy, and they discovered, they were talking about various things that had happened over the year, and one of it was the, uh, the fact that uh, Eve Queller was uh, uh, retiring from Opera Orchestra of New York. And uh, they talked about her, they talked about the impact that what she did operatically had on the opera world and how repertoire has changed because of what she did. And then at the very end of the program, they, they played a segment of a, of a commercial recording of a, of a live performance that Opera Orchestra did of Massenet's Le Cid, which featured Placido Domingo and Grace Bunbury in the leading roles. And uh, that concluded the program. And at the end of it, the commentator came back on and he said, I couldn't believe when I actually met Eve Queller that there was this little girl who had done all of this. And it, it just seemed to me actually to be the right thing. Eve actually is a little girl uh, with a big heart and with a wonderful love of music and particularly love of musicians. I've rarely seen anybody network so well and interface so well with, uh, with singers and with musicians. Um, I was, again, I was in Italy this summer and Eve was conducting at the Puccini Festival. And all of the singers that were involved with her and her uh, production of Madame Butterfly were all in love with their roles again. And in fact, one of the sopranos that was singing Butterfly came to me and they said, oh, I have rediscovered so many things that we just take for granted and that she made me focus on so that I could recreate my role. And she said it was, every performance was just wonderful, wonderful to be part of. I never wanted, the, I never wanted it to end. I think that that's really something. I think Eve has an innate ability to uh, hear a voice and um, while she's listening, she can subdivide the voice into uh, the various qualities that she feels are important. Uh, one of the things that you have to be concerned about in a voice is not just the intonation and the beauty, the quality of the sound, but also the stamina, because singing opera is, it's not easy. It's not going out and singing a couple of songs, as some people like to say. I think that they have to understand that an opera singer has to have uh, a certain a certain inner strength, not just, and that all stems from their vocality. And if you're able to analyze what a singer is doing vocally on first listening, that's a great gift, and I think Eve has that. I also think that uh, working with as many great singers as she's worked with, I, um, Eve is the kind of conductor that has the, the musical idea of what she wants to do with the piece, but like a really good uh, film director, she will work with the individual artist and pull out of them their performance. 
Now sometimes their performance isn't exactly what she originally conceived because maybe there are a, a certain, certain strengths that this artist has that all she discovers during the rehearsal period and then all of a sudden that pulls together and becomes the performance that we hear. I remember when um, uh, we did uh, a wonderful, fantastic performance in, in April of 2001 of Le Huguenot, of Meyerbeer. And uh, we had the wonderful tenor Marcello Giordani singing the role of Raoul. And we actually had a lady unknown to us singing the role of Valentin, and that's Krasimira Stoyanova. And I remember going to some of the rehearsals and then being at the performance and listening to the way Eve and Stoyanova had actually worked to make this something quite unique musically. This is an opera that I had heard when I was a student in Italy at the famous La Scala performance of Li Ugonotti with Franco Corelli and Giulietta Simeonato and Joan Sutherland. And um, it was one of the high points of my operatic life. And when we did it in Carnegie Hall with Opera Orchestra, I'm not saying that La Scala was eclipsed because that was something completely unique on its own. But what Eve managed to pull together with all of these uh, various artists in this production was really something of the highest artistic level that you could, you could want. Opera, you know, I've been to performances where I've come away and I said, oh my goodness, the orchestra was fantastic and the conducting was wonderful and the singing was quite good. Then I come away from those performances where the singing was fantastic, but maybe some of the other elements were in question. And the wonderful thing about going to opera orchestra and concert opera is that I don't have to worry about those other elements. We get the voice and we get the, sing we get the singing and we get, the, we get the, whole, the whole thing pulled together. And many times from a metaphysical standpoint, you sit there and you listen and it really takes you over. There's nothing to distract you between you and the music. There's nothing going on on the stage that isn't coming from the voice and coming from the hearts of the musicians. And it's really, really amazing uh, some of the reactions that I've witnessed during these 40 years in Carnegie Hall. But I remember particularly in that Le Huguenot, after Stoyanova finished her aria, this kind of almost scream from the audience, this kind of release of tension, but wonderful warmth and love that poured from both sides of the stage. And after she and Giordani finished the famous love duet, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last act, I must say that that ovation, I think, I think it went on for a good 15 minutes and it was something that I will never forget. Eve has been both a role model and a mentor um, uh, as far as female conductors are concerned because I know that over the years as other female conductors have come to the fore, most of, most of them in, uh, in the symphonic field, by the way. Um, many of them consulted with Eve, met with Eve. She's always had an open door policy, not just for female conductors, but for conductors in general. She, she doesn't think that um, conducting is gender specific. Um, and she has a lot of admiration for a lot of her female colleagues that are out there doing it. And she's just very, very proud to be part of it. She has a very strong character and a very strong will. And she manages to get things done uh, in usually in a non-confrontational way. Uh, when there are problems, what she tries to do is to mediate and and, and try to peel away the, the, uh, the, what, whatever is making the problem. You try to get to the source of what it is. And uh, there were an, a, number of, a number of occasions, but particularly uh, in the last five or six years with the economy downturn and things needed to be constantly revised and looked at. And um, uh, she took it on with such an incre incredible courage that you could not not support her. And many times I would come away from conversations with her, and not only dealing with opera orchestra, but dealing with life in general. 
and uh, I would maybe put up the phone or come away from the meeting and I would just say to myself, I need some of that strength too. And it was, it, she's very strong. It's not a strong of willfulness. It's just a strength of belief that what you are doing is right, willing to listen to all sides, and willing to come to a conclusion as to how to make it best work. And that's what I have found has been a, the key to her success. I find that Eve is someone who, she'll look at the problem, I mean, and she wants you to bring problems to her attention. If you see something that is possibly unraveling and it hasn't caught her attention because she's so taken with other, other situations, uh, she wants that. She wants, to be she wants to be part of it and she also wants to, wants to find the solution. I can say on very rare occasions has she come to a parting of the ways with any artist. And um, uh, maybe she's been happier with some than with others but the performances are always there, and after a 40-year history, I think that she has a really terrific track record. I think that the musicians that play with opera orchestra don't look upon it just as a gig. They move heaven and earth to play with opera orchestra for Eve, and um, no matter what the conflicts are, somehow they're always resolved and Eve ends up with her orchestra. She's very demanding about her players. She wants really good players. And let's face it, New York, I mean, as far as I'm concerned and from my experience around the world, you, New York really has the best players in the world. And um, the fact that most of those players want to play with, if they have the opportunity to play with opera orchestra, they'll move heaven and earth to play. And I think that it comes out of the fact that it's not just the enjoyment of the whole experience. It's the rehearsal, it's particularly the performance. Opera orchestra audiences are immensely appreciative and I think enormously emotionally wrapped up in what opera orchestra does. And I think a lot of that has to do with what Eve brings to the performances. I was, again, just now in Italy watching, watching her, watching her as an unknown quantity to come out to this 5,000 seat arena where she was conducting the Puccini Festival um, performances of Madame Butterfly and to see the appreciation that the, orchestra sh that the orchestra showered on her but also that the public showered on her and I won't say also that the critics I might say which was which was very nice to go to Italy and and see them write about their culture and their repertoire in the hands of of an American conductor and to write what they wrote and to say what they said. I would think that one of the more mem memorable afternoon and evenings of my life and the fact that I actually am still alive after that e afternoon was actually the first concert in Carnegie Hall. You realize that Eve had put together a quite wonderful cast for Rossini's William Tell and on the afternoon of the performance, uh, our star tenor, who was to sing the role of Arnaldo, uh, Nicolai Geda, canceled on us. He was ill and he had been, he actually had been fighting a cold for about a week, a week and a half, and it just overtook him. And that afternoon, Eve had to decide what we were going to do. Uh, we could cancel, but we didn't. Eve had, we had a cover tenor by the name of uh, Jerry LaMonaco and Jerry sang Acts 1 and Acts 3 and Act 3 is the one that has the aria with the 14 C sharps in it and um, I remember we had another tenor by the name of Mallory Walker did Act 2 which was, which was the less difficult of the three opera, the three, uh, the three acts. But when Jerry LaMonaco finished the great cabaletta uh, in the in the in the big aria, then the and the place fell in. I said, "Okay, we're going to go on. This was this is something that we'll be able to do in the future." But that day, when we had to come up with two tenors to sing one to one role, I think that 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 put a capper somewhere. 
at the first major event that uh, Montserrat Caballé sang in after her Met debut was with the uh, Opera Orchestra of New York. And uh, of course, Caballé, Caballé to this day is still a great friend of, of, of Eve's and they communicate uh, a number of times a year and they talk and um, so uh, Caballé's debut, the, the debut of Piero Capuccilli, the great Italian baritone. The second time we did William Tell, again doing it in Italian, Capuccilli sang uh, the, the aria Resto Immobile and had, it had to be repeated. The ovations went on forever and of course Mr. Capuccilli is no longer with us and a few years after his appearance with Opera Orchestra he um, was, uh, was in a terrible automobile accident which, which kind of cut his career off really at its apex. But he was one of the great Italian baritones. And um, I think I have to go back also to the appearances, uh, having been also the manager for Renata Scotto, the appearances that she had with Opera Orchestra. I think one of the things that I will always remember, we did Puccini's second opera, Edgar, which is considered the weakest of his scores and nobody knew this piece and Eve decided to do this opera and we had a cast that had Carlo Bergonzi as Edgar and Renata Scotto as Fidelia, the soprano lead. And there's a moment in the opera at the beginning of act three where the soprano sings an aria called Addio mio dolce amore. And this is a piece that's done with soprano solo and then the chorus and it, the aria ends on a very high climactic top C with the chorus. And I'll never forget that reaction. The way I, the audience actually just stood in its seats and just was completely drawn into the performance. It was so exciting. And um, uh, the, 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 the events that happened with Opera Orchestra so many times we had uh, so many wonderful artists perform with us. I want to mention Nikolai Geta again because when he sang the, the uh, Dalibor, uh, people didn't know this opera at all. They, there wasn't even a famous aria from it. And yet when Geta sang the main piece for the tenor, I thought the place was going to fall apart. It, it, it was just every evening had some stamp on it that you came away from and you just said to yourself, my goodness, I'm, I'm so happy I was here. I think the nice thing that happened with opera orchestra, and I would say this with most of the concerts that were done, I remember particularly um, Wagner's Rienzi. To hear this opera for the first time, you, you know the overture, maybe you know Rienzi's prayer, maybe you know the big aria for Adriano, but that's it, and it's a big opera. And when you heard it for the first time together as a piece of dramatic theater, you understood what Wagner was trying to do, and then you understood what was going to come after this with Wagner. And, um, and then, of course, I think the most moving performance that I can remember with Eve conducting that came from her specific performance was um, a performance of Tristan and Isolde that was done about 10 years ago in Carnegie Hall and I remember that when the opera was finished that there was absolute silence until the very last breath of overtone on the last note and then everybody just stood and just you just bathed in the in the sound of the audience and it was just wonderful but that entire performance I could see Eve I could see it really pouring out of her and giving it to the singers and the singers giving it back to her and it was it was quite a wonderful performance